This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl, episode 81. Hello, Timothy. Uh, how you doing? I'm uh, perfect I, as always. Well, I, I feel, I guess, perfect can, in my own body, as perfect as I can be, I guess. Well, the more you rub against me, honey, the better you're going to feel. What oh, can boy. I say? Oh. <laughs> Look out. Watch it. I well. I, I mean, if you want, I, if, I, if, I, I if, like to, I guess. <laughs> if you want to, you can stick your wife in between us. But, you know, I mean, she is just a slight thing. We mm, I'm just saying. Anyway, oh boy. I don't know why we're already starting off on a frisky foot. It must be the next year that we're in is just making everybody feel a little bit better. Uh, yes. Well, in terms of frisky feet, there's also frisky hands. Jonathan uh, Lamali just got sentenced to 60 days in jail, mm -hmm. two years probation and 52 days for sexual compulsion, uh, 52 classes for sexual compulsion at LAX. He found some woman that really excited him and he insisted she goes to some back room for more examination and he made her take off her panties and her bra and... Well, now the TSA, there's cameras of it all. And now the guys I mean, at that point, why don't you just why don't you just tell him to take off his damn panties? I mean, if you're if you're working the TSA and you're working the you're working the whatever metal detector, that whole thing, like what makes you think you know, like, what, what's going through your head when you decide to ma'am, go in this room. I, I, I want to check more stuff here. You thought he's going to get away with that. This just reminds me, you know, China is now in doing anal swabs for COVID. Yikes. Well, maybe I just reminded me, I was going to ask you if you've ever had a body search and fingers up here. Oh, you, you know, it's funny you say that because now I'm like, I'm like, who does that? I definitely, I, I think women probably have to do it a lot more than I do at, in the airport or have, but I definitely had like the kind of flat top haircut, closeted gay cop dad who kind of went a little overboard once like, buddy, come on, give me a break was kind of checking a little bit more than he should have. And, it, it was kind of more like, just are you that pathetic? And then, and then the other thing was like, I got a fucking plane to catch a creep. So I mean, I, I, I didn't ruin you my have life. All but... the fun. <laughs> well. uh, back back to China. Uh, now the Chinese people that have to get the COVID test are not very happy about the anal swab, but it doesn't hurt. It's just you stick it up the Q-tip up there, a couple of swishes <laughs> around. And what the problem is, it's how accurate is it? Because COVID does infect the nasal passages. But I would rather have something <laughs> up my ass than my brain tickled with a well, large shape to my Well, a swab is just, I mean, it's so much smaller than a, a, a feces. It's so much smaller than a sex toy or a penis. So I don't think it's really, it's just the idea. And they better no, make sure. I don't, I, I'm not even going to ask what's the biggest thing you've had up your ass. But let's just keep Come that on. a little bit of a miss. What? There's still time. Let's hey, just keep. I'm listening. I, I, I know no one's broken my behind man. If you want to know, what? <laughs> I thought you were my friend. Oh, well, just so <laughs> if you think I'm your friend, next time you come over, you're in for a sweet treat. Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh, well, you'll, you'll, you'll be you'll be crying to Big Lou, honey, when I bend you over the bathtub. Trust me, I'm I just I just hope. And you're laughing. You're loving well, it because I because I'm setting up for the next joke. I just hope that when they in China when they do the anal swab, they stick to one plan because they start mix up the fuck nasal one and the anal that's one. That's what people are afraid of. <laughs> Which one is it next? Hey, should you throw that one away? You know, <laughs> God. First of all, I didn't even hear about this. But well, I mean, it just reminds me of, you know, fecal implantation, which they do when well, people I, don't have correct. Hey, I mean, I'll shit in your ass if you shit you know, in my I'm not. If you, if you have Crohn's or if you have some chronic bowel issue and they, and they do these fecal implants, I mean, the idea is horrifying well you need a different but, kind of bacteria up yeah, there hey right, is it you're full people, of it already i mean exactly i know a little bit about it is, is it like people who've had like nuke levels of antibiotics is it some infection and so they have to bring back probiotics enzymes so so you know just like their sperm banks are there dump banks i mean do people like i'm Ooh. here to deliver my feces for the <laughs> feces implant all right speaking about a crock of shit <laughs> i love this story Okay. Proud Boys leader, oh boy, <laughs> Enrique Tario, was an FBI informant. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, four years ago, but he was ratting out like marijuana growers. Yeah, what an asshole. Uh, 
he was rat- ratting out, I guess, drug dealers. But look, once it once an FBI informant, probably always. Well, he's one of these classic right winger Miami like Cuban guys that just like I don't know. They seem like not really well informed. I I, I don't I don't know what's going on here, but. Yeah, he first of all, he got busted for like some sleazy, like selling medical supplies, like <laughs> diabetes kits. And then, of course, he was, he was also selling like anabolic steroids and, <laughs> and ph- pharma opiates. And then he helped the FBI like bust like marijuana grow houses. Yeah. I, I, right. It's it so, so wrong. So yeah, wrong. So wrong. Well, look, now they're up to how many have they arrested so far? But uh, I want to know how many federal cases are coming down. I think they've got about 200 people arrested. It ain't stopping there from the January 6th debacle. I'm very, I don't know why they let that little female runt who supposedly stole Nancy Pelosi's computer out to go to her mom's house with an ankle bracelet. What the hell? You know, when the emotions were high, a lot of Republicans were turning on Trump, but right as of yesterday, it seems like with the Senate, I mean, they're they're, they're all Uh, kind of still... Bunkering down, like we're going to support this guy. Get rid of them all. Now, maybe this will blow the lid off something, and I cannot wait. Explosive new book claims the KGB began grooming young and vain Donald Trump 40 years ago by saving him from financial ruin, turned him into a Russian asset who gave Putin everything he wanted. The title of the book, and it's coming out in a few weeks, is American Compromat, How the KGB Cultivated Donald Trump and Related Tales of Sex, Greed, Power, and Treachery by Craig Unger. Oh, it's out. It came out yesterday. Oh. I cannot wait. This looks like, I'm going to say a bed burner, because I'll be I'll be sweating to get to the end of it, I'm telling you. Well, oh, yes. Yeah, well, and, he, you know, and look, by, by the way, Craig Unger is, has written already six books. It's not like he's coming out of nowhere. He wrote a few New York Times bestsellers like House of Bush, House of Saud, House of Trump, House of Putin. So it's not like this is just some crybaby singing the blues about somebody he doesn't like. He talked to former CIA officers, FBI counterintelligence lawyers, Soviets who defected. Oh, this is going to be good. This is a head scratcher for a lot of people. Um, Heather Mushaw, who is the ASL, is a ASL translator with American Sign Language. She's top of the field. She's now the official ASL uh, translator interpreter for the White House. But she was doing extreme right wing websites. You know, Trump really won. The woman that that doctor who was talking about like demons of sperm being in her <laughs> ass or whatever she was talking about. And then basically every crazy conspiracy over the last couple of years, like here's this woman, Heather Mushaw, like w- doing her sign language, interpreting it for all these Trumpers. And now she is the a s l spokesperson for biden and everyone's confused but they're like well there's a whole vetting thing and and she's really good but it's still like huh i mean we don't you don't have we don't have any like other spokespeople for the white house from trump like it makes first of all i didn't realize there's maybe 400 sign languages out there and, and then there's the, the big wars between ASL and BSL, the British one, which is completely different signs. But I love bringing this one up. We all remember the con man sign language dude who, quote unquote, signed slash spoke at Mandela's funeral. And he just like was lying. He was next to Putin, Obama, all the most powerful people at Nelson Mandela's funeral. And this guy is like feet away from all of them making up oh. sign language on just in front of like a billion people watching. And, and all these people are like, well, that's just hand motion. That's that, that person's not saying anything. I don't know how the guy even got in. I, I don't know any of that. Well, so, somebody that needs to be freaking muzzled right now. Yes. She just needs to have her face mask super glued to Uh-oh. her lips is uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's, you know, was at the center of her harassing survivors of the Parkland school school shooting, claiming it didn't happen, following the kids. It's a false flag. Oh How stupid are these people? I mean, really? Well, I mean, look, another conspiracy coming out is, oh, January 6th was a false flag. A false flag by who? Have you heard any of these people interviewed? Well, there's a lot of dumb people out there, and I'd like to focus the dumb people 
monologue I'm about to give on the state of Florida. And right now, already, there's 45,000 people in Florida who already missed their second shot of the vaccine. Oh. And, 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 and then basically all, the, all these doctors are like, well, that was a complete waste. Like they, they didn't show up or, or they, 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 they just, or they're old and senile or, or there's people like, I regret it. I regretted the first one. I'm not coming back. So, so we have all these like other issues. Like, like, how do you get it to people? Well, how do you get people to get like the second one? You just wasted one of them. So. Florida, well, wherever this information came out, if it came out of Florida, I don't believe a fucking word of it anyway, because that first of all, they didn't even believe COVID was real. You got some of the dumbest politicians ever and biggest <laughs> corrupt looters of everything down there. Pity for some of my wonderful friends who live in that state. But then again, I guess they just don't pay attention. What can I say? Some people are paying attention. Some people are furious, including the corporation Dominion, who's su suing Giuliani. Uh, and a, I feel it looks like a bunch of like Congress people. One point three billion billion <laughs> for, for for defamation. I mean, their their business is ruined. I mean, they, literally, it's it's over because it's just too politically controversial to use them again. And they're like, we have all the proof that shit works, but these people just well. And the, and the thing is, previous voting systems and machines, I would have said fine because a lot of them were rigged or were incompetent or or were just crappy. But I mean, these have been checked and checked again. So you got to go with this as good as it gets. So David Vowell, not David Yao, David Vowell, 70 year old, armed and dangerous, is on the run. He was hanging out at Real Foot Lake in Tennessee. And he came across Chance Black, age 26, and Zachary Grooms, 25. And they saw a little pack of ducks. They were duck hunting and they're arguing about who has, who, who saw him first. And the kids, I guess, shot the ducks and the old guy went nuts. And he said, those were my ducks. And he took a shotgun and blew those kids away. And so now there, there's a whole hunting area. And there's one guy who's like a running the whole thing. Some duck hunting teacher gives lessons. To duck. He's like, no ducks are worth killing someone over. But, uh, you know, so they can't find this guy. Hey, but what about Duck Dynasty? That made me want to kill. Oh, yeah, I haven't thought about that one in a while. Well, that's I, all that, right. that was around the same time as the, uh, was that a, something boo-boo or that a baby thing? What was that? I'm not going there. I got hurt. Right, I, right, right. I got no clue. All right, so I got, I got a, you have another story. I have an animal story if you want to move, uh, wrap it up here. You know, I'd like to tie it up, Timmy. All right, well, and you've been bringing this up for a while, Lydia. Miami Heat, the NBA basketball team, is going to be the first team to start allowing spectators and i think it's the first indoor sport you know in the arena not c total capacity but just kind of cl cluster here and there but the way they're gonna let them in is by being screened through covid sniffing dogs and they're and the finally NBA, finally nba is the first and they're gonna have them and they're gonna actually not just have them be got sniffed on the way in they're gonna have them kind of going around through the stands throughout and um yeah, supposedly these COVID sniffing dogs have been proven enough that the NBA, you know, they're thinking litigiously. They talk to their doctors, their lawyers, that they're going to start bringing in COVID sniffing dogs. I trust the COVID sniffing dogs more than I do an anal swab at this point. <laughs> just saying. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I'm just saying. Yeah, yes, I do too. <laughs> well, with that, I guess we'll just go into episode 81. Laura Albert, quite a controversial figure, wrote a few, but two very, very good books, Sarah and The Heart is Deceitful Above All Things, which became a feature-length film directed by another controversial character, Aja Argento. We're not going there right now. <laughs> She's had to face a lot of consequences because she realized that in order to even get any attention as a middle-aged female writer, she had to kind of construct this ruse. It was just a different part of her personality and it kind of got out of control. But nonetheless, she's going to tell us all about what happened with the JT Leroy controversy. I'm very happy to have her on the show. <laughs> You're ready for your first date. Glad says to me two months after I've started my training. I haven't lived at the motel room in a month. I stay at the caravans. 
Sarah took off with a rich, crooked cargo inspector, and I check the room every day to see if she's back. The plastic attaché case is gone, but her bubbles are still there in the bathroom, so I know she'll come back eventually. I plan to have my own bubbles on the shelf next to hers by the time she gets back. You think you're ready? You feel okay? Glad asks, as he helps me get dressed in a muted pink leather miniskirt. I couldn't wait to show Sarah when she came home. Ready as snippers at bull ball cutting time, I say, borrowing Sarah's line. I put finishing touches on my makeup the way Sarah taught me. Glad makes me go light on the makeup, though. I want to take an iron and straighten out my hair so it flows like floss, but Glad won't hear of it. You really ought not to be wearing any makeup. The natural look will make you more lettuce than a face palette. Men pay for freckles and curls, Glad says, and wipes up my face with his hanky. Glad you're a sight worse than a mother dressing her daughter for prom night, Sunday laughs. Sunday is a Texas honey blonde with a bone bigger than pies. Sunday's specialty is cheerleaders. You'd be surprised by how many football players want a cheerleader with cock, she says, adjusting the miniature pom-poms in her hair. Glad picked out a truck driver everyone knew. He's a nice man that only wants to diddle you, Sunday says. Remember to watch the clock on the dash, Pi says, and gracefully kisses the air next to either side of my cheeks. Good luck. Glad just wrings his hands and makes me feel nervous. I walk in the flat white Mary Janes Glad made me wear instead of the spike heels I wanted out of the caravans with everyone seeing me off, past the doves, and into the lower lit fluorescent nighttime of the overnight truck lot. The nice man's truck is right where Glad said it would be, five rows in and seven across. It is a plain truck, nothing special, no custom anything. The door is a dark blue, and I can see my face mirrored in it. I squint my eyes so I can pretend I am seeing Sarah's reflection. I'm supposed to tell the nice man my name is Cherry Vanilla. But after I knock and he says, who's there? The name, Sarah, just comes out of my mouth. At first, I'm scared of the nice man. He reminds me of a New Orleans voodoo priest his eyes rimmed with a thick black tattoo. Then I realize, after I sit on his lap a little and he talks to me in his near indecipherable Appalachian twang, that he is just a laid off coal miner. And it's true what they say, the dust settles in every crease of skin like a new layer of pigment. Started in the mines when I was 10, he says, and places his charcoal-lined hands gently on my waist. He is from Mingo County, West Virginia. Everyone in West Virginia, no matter how bad off they are, gives thanks at least they don't live in Mingo County. I used to lie on the bed with my brother at night while my mama listened to the Christ Cure radio show, and my daddy sucked on a piece of coal to help his graveyard cough. He tells me, while bouncing me tenderly on his knee. I thought about asking him if he heard my grandfather's sermons too, as his show came on not too long after the Christ Cure radio show and was very popular in Mingo County. But I remember what Glad told me about not getting personal about my life. It ruins the fantasy of who they want you to be, Glad had said. I do love Jesus, the nice man says, and begins to run his hands up under my pink skirt and to my peach panties. And you are such a sweet thing. I hope he will say the name I told him. I want to hear her name while his hands begin to diddle me. I close my eyes and let him rock me and caress me. Sarah, 
he finally whispers into my ear. I'm here, I whisper back, not going nowhere. I let my eyes roll back into my head in pleasure. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and our special guest, Laura Albert, also previously, I don't know if presently still known as the author, J.T. Leroy, who wrote, actually, in my opinion, some of the greatest works of fiction, which read so much like reality, it was part of a problem that followed, Sarah, The Heart is Deceitful Above All Things, and Harold's End. I just want to start by saying, Laura, really, those are great works of accomplishment. And I was one of the few people, I don't, I don't know if I had any place to say it, but when the whole situation broke open, that I always felt, you know what? It's about the fucking work. It's about the literature. Thank you. And, and also, in case people don't know what the, what the scandal was, and I'm so glad you call it, it's not a fucking hoax, by the way, is that these books were written and in order to get them published because, and I know from my own personal experience, by the way, when I wrote Paradoxia, I sent out 100 copies. I got seven reviews. Now, maybe if my name would have been Lenny Lunch, you know what? I, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So Laura <laughs> created, as she called it, an avatar and started writing articles and, and mm-hmm. they got a lot of attention immediately and then had some books published. And we'll go more into this. I just want to start this with a great quote that you said in the documentary. And I love these two quotes. You said, my goal is I wanted to be a healthy human, you know, being and, and everything that came out of that desire. And I think that, okay, if it's different, it's, and it's not a fucking hoax, but if I need to be whoever the fuck I need to be, you didn't say what is the problem, but I'll say, then what is the fucking problem? And I don't know if this quote followed, but it came somewhere else, but you said, maybe I'm David Milch. Maybe I'm Aster. Maybe I'm Speedy. Maybe I'm an amalgam of the universal unconscious of whatever the fuck, you know? Maybe I'm you. And I have to say that pretty much really sums up the dilemma you encountered. Welcome, Laura. Well, mm-hmm. thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, and Lydia, it's, it's an honor because I grew up knowing who you were and, and you, you, were, you were a rock star. You were... <laughs> Honey, in your mind, I'm a rock star? <laughs> well, well, I'm rock solid. <laughs> Well, I mean, okay. I, I grew up in the New York punk scene and you were out there um, actually living and doing where I did not have that confidence. I was very much hiding and being in my fantasy kind of world of existing. I mean, every now and then I would go out, but the the trauma that I had experienced, everyone reacts very different to trauma. And for me, I was carrying around so much shame that I could not be in my skin and we didn't understand. Uh, there was no kind of, uh, it was a very strict gender binary. Yes. Right. So well, what there, I found very interesting in the documentary is that you would actually dress your sister up and send her out. I mean, even as of having your first story published at seven, but even at, in a sense, you were already sending out an avatar of yourself just to go to punk rock concerts. You know, if for me, it was using art as a pushback against the dominant culture narratives, as I think you would understand. I mean, for me, the creation of J.T. Leroy was not to get published. It, all of it, I had, I was living in this other world of a boy if I could have been a boy, because to me, that was how you got rescued. I mean, think about it, Lydia. When we were kids, I know. did not talk about physical and sexual abuse. And when they did, when they started to, it was always a cue, the after, the after school specials, which people don't even know what those are anymore. But when they would start to talk about it, it was always a cute, blonde hair, blue eyed, marketable boy. Yeah. And I fit, got being fit, a fat, yeah, chubby, I, I had no way to check the system, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Laura, my first public, one of my first public stories was called Daddy Dearest in the early 80s. And it was about the subject nobody was talking about at that time, which was about familial sexual abuse. And as you said previously, everybody reacts to trauma differently. And in the sense that you had to create 
because also, look, people don't understand, and we can go into whatever their theories were after they felt they were betrayed by this. You were reaching out, and as you said, the emotions were was real. It says fucking fiction. You were reaching out to people, and they were responding. It doesn't matter what voice you were using or what character. It's also interesting to me that you said it's not multiple personality. See, I think I'm a functioning, first of all, musical schizophrenic, but I have met, I call my body a hotel that many monsters live in. A lot of them party girls. They have different names. I understand, honey. I do. I mean, especially if um, punk music or just music in general was a big influence on you. I mean, look at those models. Uh, look at those characters. There's tons of fictitious stage names, <laughs> alter egos. I mean, Prince had how many different alter egos? I, I mean, the list goes on. And of course, androgyny or just the general ambiguity of, of sex. I mean, that you can go back to the Castrati's um, and it's... And, well, I wish you, there were the, more of those now, Tim. I'm no, volunteering with, 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 uh, to perform the operation. But with JT Leroy, isn't that the, 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 the case that, that didn't reach puberty or correct me if I'm wrong, and then there was some kind of mutilation of the genitals and the, the voice was high? Or am I thinking about a different character? But yeah, the Castrati's, that was a whole thing. There's, and music has a long history of this. So is the literary community just uptight? I mean, it seems like if you read fiction, you'd be open to fiction. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting, the reaction of when I was outed, this is 2005, 2006. And, you know, I've traveled around the world talking to people and people who didn't know when they watch the film or when they read the books, they're just struck. They're, they need to have it explained to them why this was a scandal. Why was this a problem? They're like, they just do not they can't wrap their head, heads around well, it. Like and especially, that. look, Europe is going to get it more than America because we're so fucking ignorant here anyway. Well, they and did Europe, right away. Right away. Yeah. France was the first. Brazil yeah. was the first country to put my books out under my name in 2010. They brought me down with Alice Walker. It's because they know that writing work, writing books is actually hard. They understand that because yeah. I think a lot of people in the U.S. have this idea, well, of course I can write a book. Of course I can do that. Where Would they go to a ballet and say, oh, I could do that. I've had writers say to me, I could have written that book. So yeah, well, they didn't, did they? <laughs> yeah, is, is, it, is it almost was like a uh, self-fulfilled prophecy? Like you had this, correct me if I'm wrong, this kind of shame or just lack of confidence to go out there as Laura Alpert. And then yet the fans uh, got all disappointed about finding out who you really were. It was just like this, it was a, a projection, it seems like. I, I don't, well, I don't I think understand. I think some got disappointed, and, and like, like she said, and Europe and in other countries, they weren't disappointed because they understood better. Laura, when finally it was revealed, or put it this way, did you have much more confidence after you were able to just re be more comfortable in your own body by the reconfiguration of it by whatever means necessary? Because we are trapped yeah, I, I think the awful thing was the way it was presented by, you had Warren St. John from the New York Times, who was basically getting called out by another white male from, I guess, the Washington Post, and they were competing with their egos. They, instead of stepping back and saying, well, why would somebody do this? What is this about? Again, for them, they used a market-based approach. They put their paradigm of what motivated right. them, which was, it was like patriarchal uh, capitalist agenda, which is like, oh, of course I did this to get a deal or to get fame or to meet Madonna. When, if you flip the paradigm, that's why there are so many people who did go back to the work because it's all there. If you read Sarah, everything is there. The felt authenticity, it says fiction, this, the, it's predicted he is worshipped and he is a fraud he is taken <laughs> yeah, out exactly and him. it's yeah. all there well, if you listen to the well, audio book it's <laughs> all there it, it reminds me in a way of the film privilege which is a british film about a rock star who's absolutely worshipped until it's turned against and then burn everything it's an archetypal it's, story it's it's you it, know it's absolute well maybe well lara maybe you're ahead of your time i mean you know the millie vanilli story which i actually know quite a bit <laughs> Quite a bit about, you know, it, it, when it was revealed that they weren't singing, 
the fans didn't care. It was it was actually a class action lawsuit mm -hmm. that took it down. And and he said, "Oh, you, you buy the record, you've been scammed." And we fan and of course, Millie Vanilli, those guys, Robin Fab, were too dumb to handle it. They're they're like, "We can still say." Uh, well, hang on. And for Laura, it was the opposite. When they found out the she opposite, wrote, exactly, she yeah. got sued. That was more about a movie company trying to make what they wanted to do was they wanted to expand their rights. And they actually, there's a quote in the New York Times, which would never fly now, where they're saying it was antidote films, and they're saying, we just want Miss Albert to behave. Oh, Can fuck you imagine? Off. They, uh, they, uh, they uh, need right, to spank right. me. They need to make me behave. I don't, don't know. You charge ex, don't you charge extra for that service? Yeah. I know I do. <laughs> Usually I'm doing the spank and I don't know. Just <laughs> Well, well, you know, just like Millie Vanilli, like now everything's auto-tuned. Like, so like, you, you know, no one's getting sued now. And, and now, you know, all these kids are doing, well, the difference with, with all these aliases and the difference yeah, go is ahead. I, yeah. Like, like Lydia said, I wrote my work and then there was someone yeah. who was um, being basically trying it on and you know, she yeah. was she was very charismatic and dealing with um that savannah her issues of um we both had uh, you know the, we were exploring our own i don't think we either one of us fit into the gender binary that was allowed that that was available the words it's very hard when you do not have the language to express what you are i put it you know this the saying is you can't be what you can't see you can't address what, and what i say is you can't address what you can't express and for me i really felt i had like you said and i say in the movie author the jt Leroy story that it's not multiple personality, but it is disassociation. I was doing it since I was a child, having gone through sexual abuse, I knew how to do that, but it wasn't like that Hollywood kind of Sybil bullshit, but I think- Well, and, and you know what? Not all Sybil is all bullshit. I mean, sometimes if you have traumatic brain injury from physical oh, yeah. abuse, th there is beyond dissociation. There does yeah, open yeah. up compartments, of course, but. And this is what I really related to about you, about this functioning. There's not really a name for it. You call it an avatar. It is dissociation. It is compartmentalization. But we're, it's still beyond functionable because we're actually creative in it. Yeah, it was I, a workaround for me to be able to express myself. Look, I was... I was moved from my family. I had been institutionalized. I was in foster care. I had a lot of therapy and I was very good. And you know, street kids, you get really smart at telling the social workers what they need to hear. And if you're an addict to protect, you know, they, they weren't, they weren't giving me treatment for what I needed, I had so much shame that I had no way to address it. Uh, food addiction was not at all addressed. The girls who had drug and alcohol issues were put in a program when I said, look, what they're doing with drugs and alcohol, I did with food. They looked at me like I was crazy yeah. because all the house parents had, they also had eating disorders. So I was basically saying they're addicts and that was crazy. Back and, then. Right. And part of eating disorder is a way with people that have had sexual abuse and shame mm -hmm. to keep mm -hmm. people away. It's like, stay away from me. It, right. it's, it, it's like a protective device. It is that fat, and I don't think it, that's a dirty word, becomes a protective shield. It's the wall you build around yourself. And, and it's the most immediate form of comfort. And I mean- and not only that, but the food is so terrible in this country that who's not going to be fat for just e eating the best they can eat anyway? I mean, it's... Well, it's also very numbing. I mean, for me, I could use food the way an addict could, and it was horrible because now it's wonderful that you see ideals of beauty that aren't just, you know, that kind of Calvin Klein, flat ass, tiny, you know. Honey, baseball. I never, I, I never was asked to be a Calvin Klein model. That's because finally big round asses are in style. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Laura, you seem to, you're very thin now. And are you satisfied or do you still feel insecure or, you know, what kind of, how, how does this trauma stamp into you? 
in terms of just self confidence. I mean, you've done a lot to what you overcome thought would yeah. be. Yeah, but did this find a, a level of happiness or? Well, um, should I not ask? Well, I don't know. Well, I first of all, I, I don't know if happiness is something that I'm capable of. I think I have levels of the happiest I feel is like there's this video we just did uh, where it was on a Zoom call and there was a, I don't know if you got to watch it. Lydia, um, I sent it to Simon. No, no, I haven't had a chance to see it yet, but I will before this airs. Go ahead, please, please um, describe. Well, well, there was a, f- I'll call her a fan. I don't really like that word, but a, it was a, a supporter, author, a, supporter. a supporter. Yeah, that's much better. Um, who came from Germany to see me when I was at Foils and um, she was glowering at me the entire time and her arms were cut to shit i mean and she was wearing a leather vest and it was very clear that she wanted me to see this and i kept trying to make eye contact to try to see if there was a a human being in there and she'd look away and this was not long after i had been outed so this is way before the documentary and i was getting death threats okay so you have to remember i'm still fragile <laughs> well well i didn't i whenever i would approach someone like when i met you at chris hanley's remember that at the halloween party i, okay. I was like i test the waters it's like you never knew where someone was gonna <laughs> land you yeah know? Yes. some people who you would think would completely get it didn't and other people who you you would think would anyway so so i I'm signing books, which was new for me to sign books in my name. And I have people coming up giving me uh, editions of books that I had, I didn't even ever see before that I didn't even know existed. And it was just very new. And I don't like when I sign now, what I do is I have people sit with me and I will sit there with them until they're done speaking because I could not be there for people before. And that's, that's the main if there's one mm. sin that I feel that is from this, that was, I could not be available because people came and they needed to connect with the person who wrote that and Savannah could not give that to them. But well, as, <laughs> as, I, as I call the merchandise table, the hugging and kissing booth, because mm. I feel like Mother Teresa, everybody needs mm. a hug. And if they need it, I'm going to give it to them. I mean, they're there for a reason because your voice or my voice or whatever voice that speaks to them, speaks to them like no other. And you are a very, very good hugger. <laughs> yeah. She's a good hugger. Ooh. Well, some, some some people come to the table for a slap and a beating and not because... But are they... Oh, well, they want the hug afterwards. It's their version of the hug. That's They want, you know, they want different permutations and variations. I hold no judgment affection. against people's desires if they're willing to express them to me. Doesn't mean I have to fulfill them, but when I see desires that are that the people have felt have been almost impossible to fulfill sometimes you just have to inhabit that role to give them relief i'm kind that way uh, laura technical question well well let me let me just finish what happened with this the yes the, the cutter the okay. german cutter the german cutter i noticed she was waiting till she got to the end of the line letting everyone come in i she had a big bag and i i just felt Oh my God, maybe she's going to shoot me, stab me. I don't know. She got to the, in front of the table and she slammed down kind of like a carpet bag and starts to open it. And she's just, there's, there's just this blank kind of, and she opens it and she takes down out a book and she slams it down. And she wanted me to sign her diary and she started talk she just started talking to me about how much what my work not just the work but the way it had been expressed she understood the paradigm because she came from it it wasn't the white male patriarchal she understood the flip of it and i got up and i hugged her because words wouldn't say what i needed what needed to be communicated and i talked to her And I shared that sometimes I very often do not know how I'm going to make it through a day. And this man 
uh, this French artist took a photograph and the photograph is taken on a life of its own because you see me hugging her and she cannot hug back. Her arms are up and he's like making almost like fists, but you see her sliced arms and we're, we're crying together. It, it's kind of become this iconic image, but the story behind it, she wrote to me, she stopped cutting, she went to art school. So I've had this experience around the world. So what for me, what other people think, it took me a while to move past the defending, explaining, justifying, and to just, and writing for me has gotten to help me understand exactly what it was and what it was not. Really beautifully put, Laura. Exactly. Really beautifully put. Well, it, it was after I was outed, it was really um, upsetting. I mean, it was horrible because, you know, he did have a relationship with people and I really feel that sacred. And the feeling was, oh my God, how do I explain this? Because I don't even know. Right. And a, a part of you is very lost and lonely because all of these people that were related, that could identify with you, that were supportive and encouraging. And I'm sure that when it started, and this went on for quite a while and just kept growing. And who doesn't want a chance to reach out to someone whose work they respect and why you were able to penetrate into this variety of, of circles is because the writing stood up for itself. Otherwise, people would not have called you back, talked to you, read your stories, or engaged. And yeah. if they felt but hurt after, you know, if they felt that they had been milked or soaked, you still have to go back to what it is. And what it is is the fucking work. Well, I mean, I think part of it was it's very hard when the media tells yes. you, instructs you how to feel. If I remember when I was 11, I was hearing about punk for the first time and I heard a report. It was on the news and there was this guy named Sid Vicious who had attacked, <laughs> I think it was Patty Smith's brother and broken a beer mug. I just remember I felt what is this punk rock? They wanted you to feel disgust and horror. And that's exactly how I felt. <laughs> Little did I know in a couple of years, it would be my life. My life would revolve around that. And the media, basically their language that they used, and you have to pay attention to how the media, what language they use. It was very specific. They really were evoking a sentiment, which is that she has done some perpetrator, culprit, the jig is up, come clean. There was no way in hell anyone was going to see me as anything other. A hoax is somebody who does something with malicious intent. They're there. They're trying to do something. They're tricking you. And there was, there was no, I malice i wasn't there thinking haha i'm gonna do this or get this i never stole money Which, i mean the, the thing is the thing is if you could have only really ha ha and fuck you because <laughs> absolutely celebrities deserve that anyway <laughs> the media deserves that anyway and so fucking what back to what it was the emotion and it doesn't have to be when I first started talking about my own personal traumatic experiences, I knew mine wasn't the worst fucking thing, but I knew I had to talk about it because other people had the same similar experiences and the aftermath of the cause of that trauma. Right. And it's something that, again, uh, at that point, both when I began and when you were when you were writing, there wasn't that much expression about these things from a female point of view. Not at all. It's like, again, you can't express what's not addressed. And if you come from that level of abuse, do you know, do you know, Lydia, that that trauma was not in the DSM, which, you know, you know, the DSM is the psychiatric yeah. medical book. Until 1983, I entered foster care in that year. It was like 83 or 84. That was the year I entered into foster care. So they didn't even have, they, they knew about it, but it was like for soldiers who had either done something or had something done to them. 
But now people are like, oh, my mom is making me do my homework. I have trauma. Oh, he you grabbed know. my ass. It's <laughs> traumatic. We offered to buy me a drink. Oh, we're not even going to go to that subject because you and I can have that discussion other times because that's going to be even a bigger shitstorm than either of us have ever caused. You know exactly what I'm talking about because yeah. you just oh, yeah. put it in perspective. Well, well, yeah, I mean, there's an incredible so just just even since the film was made you have to remember that author the jt roy story was made before me too and the director uh, yeah, you know yeah. i had no say in that editing and they did a good job he did a great job he's a it's very think about documentaries it's a new form of documentary it's entertaining as shit there's not one boring moment no you have and to it's mostly it. you and that success at last allowed real. <laughs> a woman to speak allowed you know how mad that made that as if it's like you have errol morris doing fog of war where you have robert mcnamara going <laughs> on and nobody's saying well who's there you saying the <laughs> thing the mistake he made is he should have said yes we fact checked every fucking thing i yeah. said they actually did yeah. everything i said they fact checked well you know in, in a historical perspective of all of this and ptsd it wasn't really till the Vietnam War that men even began addressing what happened in war. Like our grandfathers, right. our great grandfathers would come back, whatever, alcoholics, abusers, right. silent, going to the bar, affairs, suicides. But it wasn't really addressed. It's just what men had to do. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that they couldn't even really address that grave and, and from the cave issue until uh, the 70s tells you exactly how far we have not fucking come. Have right. you seen this documentary called Crazy Not Insane? I, re I recommend it because it's about two women that were working with violent juveniles in Bellevue about 40 years ago, and they started doing MRIs of the brains of these young juveniles, mostly who had been absolutely abused, physically assaulted. And, you know, she even, in the course of her career, her name was Ann Bass, uh, talked to Ted Bundy and Arthur Shawcross, but actually photographing brains, which from either trauma or physical abuse had actually been altered and which is what causes certain forms of violence, especially in men. Oh, yeah. Oh, they, well, even... They, Women usually turn it inwards. Well, it, they know even, even from microaggressions, constant microaggressions. So even for me growing up... We, being constantly attacked because of my body or being Jewish was- Or just being weird as most of yeah, us who yeah. listen to this podcast are. And you know, the, I think the difference too is my generation, we were pretty proud of being weird. Like we, it was much, was there just less bullying where in my say growing up in the early seventies, but I think that glitter and glam Anyone that was weird or could identify with that, we just felt above it. So well, fuck well, you. Well, you. You're not weird you, enough. <laughs> you went you went into that and there's something about you that you have that freedom like Fayette, who's a good friend of mine. I loved that podcast that you did with uh, her. Fayette Hauser of the well, Cockettes, previous yeah. podcast, yes. I love her. But I, I do think it's kind of a generational thing. And I'm a few years older than you, but so, I mean, I think that even though I looked goth in 73, although I was never goth, uh, still there was this certain freedom that came out of the sixties, which then of course we rebelled against anyway as no wave nihilist. But I think that it gave us a sense of, it just gave us a bigger sense of freedom. We were less, we were the bullies. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I, I really admired the wave that was in front of me, which was the Mud Club kind of Deborah Harry and all you guys in that scene. When I went into the punk scene, it was very male oriented. The lie was that it was it was youth, but it was still male dominated and girls and could pretty be much dumb in America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean there were some really creative interesting things but it was still a boys club. It was a lie agreed upon. I mean that that girls could have power. You could be a bass player maybe 
um, but you were the girlfriend. And there were a lot of there were a lot of closeted gay males that still have not come out in that hardcore yeah. punk scene. Well, well, the skin is skin is. You got it, definitely. baby. All you have oh to do God. is all you have to do is talk to Ms. Neon about that, as she's turned a few of those oh, boys it? out. Oh yeah. <laughs> so Laura, did any of the people that you pursued that you were fans of after this whole thing broke, did any actually come back to you or did they all just Great question. No, a lot. A, a lot. Yeah. I mean, Great. you know, it, I mean, you have to think about people's reaction was very much informed by how they connected to the work. So people came to the work for a number of different reasons, right? So some there were some people that were, um, it was erotic for them because they weren't really, uh, I'm, I'm writing about gender exploration and I'm dealing with ways of handling physical and emotional abuse in ways that I did not see represented. I usually saw it fetishized and the abused child was angelic and it was very kind of melodramatic and that's fine. But for me, it didn't feel authentic. So, you know, there's, it's, it wasn't misery lit. There's a lot of humor. There's a lot of, um, you, I'm asking you to understand why somebody becomes um, you know, you, you actually, I'm asking you to have compassion and, and um, hold some of these people that normally they would just be demonized. Well, and, and, and also, even if the exact details are not your story, they are somebody's story. And this is, this is the other issue. It's not like this is a fantastical but what pisses me off is when somebody said, well, thank God that didn't happen. It's like, look, oh. bitch, I was in foster care and institutionalized with so much. No, believe me. Yeah. Yes, it does. That's your fantasy that this shit is made up because yeah. you know what? It's people when we I was in the group home, they would the people in the building were trying to evict us because we were too black, too Latina, too punk, too fat, too whatever <laughs> the fuck. We were not convenient yeah. and they right. wanted us the fuck out, you know? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, we want the doe-eyed little like you know, and they prefer the truth is, Lydia, like we know, they prefer a dead abused child. Like remember when that um, what was that little girl who got killed? And Jean know, Benet. And, well, well, I don't do there. Find out. <laughs> rem remember, there was like the. I, oh, it's like it's. Right well, I mean, to to remember one little girl that's been murdered or one little boy <laughs> is to is to narrow it down as if that's the archetype when there's millions of millions. children murdered and psychically, psychologically emotionally murdered every year especially well, how many are in missing country. right now yeah in the border wish, well, how please. many are missing right now <laughs> well, well even even with what's going on right now with yeah, yeah in the the kids that are locked up in cages and that's why to me <sighs> it's only through narrative telling stories where you care and that's why i i feel uncomfortable with memoir i'm not quite sure what to call what I'm working on. Like, so for instance, I just finished the group home section and I called, um, we have a group where I talk to my house parents, my social workers, um, the girls from the group home. And like, I'm writing a lot about my relationship with one girl named Lauren. And like, we talk a lot on Facebook and it, it's, when I talk to her about the story, because I'll ask her to read what I'm writing about and fact check stuff, when I say, I said, okay, I moved Lauren out. I moved Laura out. I moved us out. And I'm trying to hold it as factually as what it was. But at the same time, it's how can you ever, unless you had, uh, even if you had a video that, <laughs> you did, how can you capture the internal uh, experience? Uh, ex well, okay. So Laura, my book, Paradoxia, which is a memoir, and it's mm -hmm. as, you know, people always say, oh, did all that really, did you really do all that? And I'm like, what about what I can't remember doing? Not only did I do all of that in 120 pages, which took you two hours to read, mm -hmm. I lived it for my life. But what's interesting is this. I write very little fiction, but I have some fiction stories, and they're pretty fantastic. And I have to say, 
in a compile in an anthology I put out, people actually thought they were more convinced that the piece of fiction I wrote, which was a combination of my life and a friend of mine in Pittsburgh, who was like my, uh, like my dirty hillbilly cousin. It was like a female wrestler, huh, with bikers. They thought that was the true story. There you go. Well, it's the felt authenticity, you know, that that you access because you're very alive and available to you have a very high emotional IQ and you're a crafted writer, you're a crafted artist. So you're able to convey it's felt authenticity. There are plenty of people who can get things uh, factually right, but there's no emotional compassion there. There's just not. I'm not interested in transgressive work personally. Like I, I was, I remember when I was a punk, I really wanted to go to like the worst horror films. I wanted to see what I could endure. And to me, I, I got out of that stage. And what to me that is, is dead in sensibilities. Like there are writers who, you know, like, let me write the most disgusting, horrible thing. And that's speaking to dead in sensibilities where you want to feel alive. And what I'm interested in is taking you on a journey where I'm like you walk through the valley of death, but I'm beneath you. I'm supporting you. I'm holding you. And I want to take you out, but I want you to see and feel. I want you to reconnect your nerve endings. I'm not interested in making you with shock, like going yeah. on a roller coaster to feel yeah. alive because then you just, you haven't really connected to the felt uh, community yeah. of being part of something larger than yourself. I mean, I've nothing that I've ever written or said or done did I ever feel was shocking. And of course, you know, there was a lot of outrage when I made the Richard Kern films, Right Side of My Brain and Fingered, when I was merely, and with Right Side of My Brain, trying to express a type of female desire that I had not seen expressed in literature nor film, and also as an homage to Polanski's repulsion, and with Finger to just wanting to make a drive and exploitation film trailer based on a lot of real experiences that have happened. And that became such controversial because, oh, it's the most feminist statement. Oh, it's completely misogynist. All I wanted to do was make a drive-in trailer, like the kind I used to love to see at the drive-ins, that was based on some of my real life experiences and shoot it in black and white and make it not, there might be pornographic elements. It's not pornography because it doesn't get you hot. It's not about that. It's about showing these other sides of female obsessiveness. That's Well, well I mean, it, it, again, we always have to remember that attributes that women express that the same attributes that are ascribed to men are positives and for women a woman is hysterical or emotional when the correlation for a man is oh, they're all positive but you know, you know what but I, guess, but I guess we both kind of showed them by not being felled by either their expectations their opinions their criticisms their bullshit we've traveled the world told <laughs> the truth according to however way in which we express it details are relevant to that in a way that other people respond to. What I want to know is what was the, not the breaking point, but kind of the mending point after all of this that made you say, okay, now I'm Laura Albert, deal with it, motherfuckers. And maybe you had to say that to yourself as well. Well, I never would have outed myself, even though I was ready for it. I mean, a lot of people knew I was I was basically outing myself all the time. It was a, it was a very, it wasn't, a, it was kind of a lot of people knew. At first, I, it was a very carefully guarded secret, but I was getting braver and braver. I mean, you know, I, I told Billy Corgan, I, who was really wonderful. He was really wonderful. I and mean, and how, of, great, how great is that to just have somebody that you really like yeah. who just got it? He seemed to have gotten it right off the bat. Right away, right away. Because Perfect. He, he came from abuse, you know, yeah. that he, yeah. he had been attacked by Spin Magazine for, he talked about, he was one of the first rock stars to talk about having been abused. And now it's everyone, it's, it's so. Yeah, we know. Uh, but you, but you can't imagine that we at the time 
preferred our rock stars to be strong. And it was way before emo, and he sure was an emo, but he talked about that and they accused him of doing that to try to like <sighs> records or some bullshit. Oh, so, right. A real popular, a real popular concept there. Such yeah, assholes. But, but yeah, and it's even as if the idea, like it's it's the idea of what would sell books, like the idea that people bought a book because they feel sorry. You don't barely give a quarter to someone on the street yeah. who's homeless. You don't go buy a book because you feel sorry. No. What year was the official outing? I'm, I, 20, it was, it was, the news cycle was so much longer than it was like 05 to 06. I like to say I was like the Harvey Weinstein of 05, <gasps> 06, but I just forgot, <laughs> but I just forgot to rape anyone. <laughs> oh, punchline. Okay, um, uh, I, I just want to touch on this lightly, if you don't mind. How weird is it that Jimmy Bennett, who Oh, we played, have to talk. Oh, my. Yes, we oh, have honey, to. Yeah, yeah, first yeah, of yeah. all, first uh, of all, let me, let me, let me begin. We got to uh, unpack the Argento. Yes. Oh, boy. Okay, oh first boy. of all, first of all, the first time I met Aja Argento, the first thing she told me was, I have trust issues. I'm like, well, I don't. And she wanted me to do, <laughs> wanted me to do the still photography for the film because- I had done a series of black and white photos of teenage boys in New Orleans in order to show boys their power and their beauty, so hoping that they wouldn't conform to the Nike swastika. I mean, I had done many series of photographs already. So she saw those, and then she took me on. And I told her in the very beginning, if she needed help, first of all, I suggested she get a fucking voice coach and drop the Italian accent, which ruined the film because she didn't. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, well, I, mean, I, I told her she shouldn't even play Sarah. That she thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're going to, this is, I'm going to give you a note, just a quick overview about my experiences there. So I have these amazing photos of not only Jimmy Bennett, who was a one take wonder and the Sprouse, the Sprouse boys who then became Disney stars. <laughs> but then, I mean, Riverdale and blah, blah. Anyway, I have the incredible photos of that. But Aja went through something on the film as, that I called the a ring of wrath, where every day somebody else was ruining the film. First, it's the catering people. Then it's the lighting guy. Then it's the sound guy. And it really, and another point that was great is she asked me for photos for Italian Vogue. And what is she playing? A fucking drug addict stripper. And she goes, where is the glamour? And the wardrobe people hated her so much at this point that they started showing the worst pictures around going, where is the glamour? So, of course, the last, very last day on the set of The, Th of the Hardest Deceitful Above All Things Based on the Book was I'm packing up to get out. I have hair. I am dyeing my hair. I have the last menstruation of my life, which is so painful. I literally pluck a tiny seahorse of blood out of the toilet and scream at it. I'm packing up burnt um, negatives because I found a, a, bur a burnt out photographic studio and, and cameras that are burnt. I've got black soot on my hands, black dye on my hair, a seahorse of blood on my fingernail. And I get the call that I hadn't had the entire shoot. Aja wants you back on the set. I'm like the ring of wrath. So I go there. I'm like, what? And she goes, are you sure you've got enough photos? I'm talking thousands. Now, when I do a photo shoot, I usually take about 10 photos because I get it. I said, what are you talking about? Of course I got the photos. Anyway, later on, she apologized for being a monster, which, which I said, look, uh, we all are, but you just have to know who to be a monster to. Anyway, cut to the future. Jimmy Bennett at seven in the film then comes and accuses Aja of being uh, a sexual abuser after he had already been accused of domestic violence himself, tried to sue his parents, and was blackmailing her for money. What the fuck? Now, first of all, <laughs> how did you feel about that film <laughs> when it came out? How did well, you feel about the end let's, let's, let's take the Jimmy Bennett thing. Okay. okay. First, yes. of all, um, first of all, he, you need to unpack his past a little bit because he was painted that way, but there's another way to flip that, which is that he was a child actor. His parents, it was a very dysfunctional upbringing. He has had a lot of health issues. Mm. Um, he, his money was 
taken from him. They they did not follow the the Keegan rule, you know, where his money yeah. is put away from him. It's a very dysfunctional world, as we know, for a child to yeah. grow up and be expected to be the sole supporter. It it can twist very few children, especially, I mean, think of the role he was playing. He was not protected oh, in that film. No, no. He and, and he was amazing. He, he was, was amazing. But, but we know enough, and I was not there when he was filming those things, and I yeah. was assured that the children would be protected, but he was not because Argento and a number of people were using drugs. Uh, they were, you know, she was smoking crack, okay? Yeah. So <laughs> there was a lot of drug use on that. Ring so, of so wrath. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's be really real here that he was really exposed and kids can just by being around it, it it can be suggested as we know from false memory syndrome right, right. But, but, but 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 he came back and said she did this when he was but, already but, almost legal but, age but, but the thing is let's <laughs> think of this right he has no career the power imbalance yeah okay there is a phenomenal power imbalance she played his mother she's this big glamorous star what need does she have to make this a sexual relationship? What? He has nothing. He has no career. And she's played the abusive mother, the complexity yeah. of it, yeah. where he's in love with his mother and she's enacting this kind of relationship. And comes the back. power of balance alone. He has been, re he's a, he has had instability in his life. He has had problems. Why does she, of all the people out there, why does she have to even fuck? with this child right. he was a child i'll tell you if it was my kid i would take her the fuck out i'm sorry it's not okay it's well, not let's okay. also it's not okay but let's also look at it from this angle because i don't like any of the angles that about this <laughs> at all <laughs> it could be aja as a traumatized person herself extremely traumatized also by the family dynamic and the power imbalance if somebody's reaching out to her, and I'm sure it wasn't her going to seduce him. I, I don't know. I don't know the facts. Yeah, well, maybe, you know, let me just finish. Maybe she felt that she could. And we don't know what we don't really know what happened in that bedroom. But maybe she felt that she could reach out to him and offer him comfort. And by the way, he wasn't 12 years old when this happened. He wasn't seven. He was 17. And in some states... That's a legal age. So that's but another you know thing. What? It doesn't, his prefrontal cortex is not fucking closed. He could have been 25. The thing is, I have no doubt <laughs> that she has experienced a fuckload of trauma. Look at her father. He had her in. Well, she and I are a predator, but we're predators of a different type. Well, um, you know, there's a point <laughs> where she's, she's malevolent, you know? Yes, she's she can be malevolent. Well, and well, her whole thing, her MO is getting people to use, okay? She will take someone who's sober. She, I have emails from her about her fucking casting couch. Yeah. And you know, it's... it's. Well, excuse me, but I, I, would, I might have thrown one or two to Michael Pitt at the time too, honey, but my hands were full. Uh, you know, it's... it's it's not to make drugs, life. taking people who are sober and wanting them to yeah. use. Look, I have compassion and I understand people doing things out of trauma, obviously, but there's a certain point where there's no self awareness there. Her whole thing right. about the leading the me to while. Oh, so uh, uh, I mean, okay. Now, uh, what would she, no, what she wanted to do, Lydia, was she wanted to be Angelina Jolie without doing the footwork. Okay? <laughs> well, fucking put. Now, let's, because we could talk about her indiscretions and problems for the rest of our lives, but we won't. What about the film? How did you feel about the film? Was it a success or was it a failure? And I know that you weren't on the set very much. I was. Well, yeah, a, a little bit. But yeah. A little bit, but you weren't on the set maybe enough. But I mean, again, you're not the one directing it. And I agree, she shouldn't and have been nobody in Nobody was directing it. She let the actors direct. It. That's the thing. What I think about it is each, you have to think of it almost like a Saturday Night Live sketch where each one is its own sketch. <laughs> yes, that's and true. Some are more successful than others. Like I think yeah. the one with Jeremy Renner's great. I think. Well, and the kids, I, look, the kids were amazing. 
the kids were amazing. The one that you're in with that. Uh, no, know, Peter Fonda was thing. amazing. I mean, okay. Anyway, I didn't see the film with Laura Dern. How did you react to that one? I, the script was leaked to me early on. Look, after the documentary, I had people coming saying, we want to make a movie about you. Wait, what year did the documentary, uh, what year did you film it in and what year did it come out? The author, uh, J.T. Leroy story. I think, what year did it come out? It, 2016. Okay. Time Thank you, Jim. We're having fun or not. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, so... Afterward, afterwards, I had, of course, everyone and their mother wanting to make a movie. And we were talking, Jeff Fierzig said, look, I had so much that I had to cut. It was, it should have been like a series. <laughs> and so we talked about doing- I'm so glad a- you have the strength to have done that because it said, and it represented so much. It really did. It explained so beautifully, so much. And it was so important that you were saying those words. Well, he did a great job. I mean, he really, there was, it's a hard story to kind of put together because people want black or white and it's got a lot of, it has a lot of complexity, you know? Was your son aware of the, just the kind of the boiling point and, and the outing? I mean, how aware was your son of all, all of this when it all kind of come, came down and god he looked like such a cute little elf at that point i mean i'm he, sure he's still amazing he's really he's really really sweet he's you know we we talk about it a lot well not a lot but we have and he he said he liked being thor it allowed he felt empowered i mean he feels very hashtag blessed to have had the experience he's a very down-to-earth kid everyone who meets him really really He's just a very not entitled, unentitled, is that the word? Um, well, compassionate <laughs> person, which is grand. Compassionate, great sense of humor. How is your relationship with Savannah? Do you still have I one? Talk to, I don't talk to her at all. I mean, you know, she did that movie, and I really don't think she... What movie? And the Laura Dern one. Okay. The script was leaked to me early on. I read it, and... It was terrible. It was, yeah, it, okay. Nobody has a motive. It doesn't, it's not okay. written from the inside. And it's too bad because Laura Dern is usually pretty great. But if she doesn't yeah, have but, the material. But she can't shine shit. You know, you can. You, you can't can polish shine, a turd. You can shine brass. You can shine silver, but you can't shine shit. Can't and polish problem, a turd. No, but nobody has a motive in it. You can't yeah. even, I mean. It's just not written from the inside. And I don't really think she understands it. And they were afraid of my books. I, it yeah. really is offensive that Kristen Stewart's there riffing on my books, oh, yeah, not yeah, even, yeah. Uh, you know, the whole thing. So, so Laura, where, where are you now, babe? What's going on? What are you working on? And also, look, you were always writing from a very early age. But it seems to me like you've always been writing. So do you have a lot of writing that isn't published? And what are you working on now? And how do you feel if you're not working? I mean, I've got no problems if I'm not doing anything. (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. Uh, I mean, we we are always, you know, there's the fallow time when even when we're not working, we're working. You have to, right, you're accumulating information. Yeah, and so I'm always amazed how something I experience or read later informs something that I put down, and I didn't even know that it was going to be there. I mean, my whole writing about lot lizards, I found that out from a sex, a phone sex client, you know, about, I mean, nobody knew about that stuff, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm like I said, I'm working on this book, and it it will be on the group of home book, which is great. Well, it, it's it's the memoir, but it's not all the JT stuff. I mean, it's people need to understand what the soil was. It's not the smoke and mirrors and all that other stuff. That, do you do you miss that you don't have JT to speak from, or was it just enough and complete, and that was that? Well, you know, it was very healing for me. It's like a kind of phantom limb to have the, I always wanted to be a boy and I didn't have a body that was able to accommodate that. That's why they make strap-ons, honey. Only kidding. (laughs) (laughs) I I love it when you laugh. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, 
it was it I wasn't in the right time for that, you know. And Laura, I feel as much male, if not maybe two, five, ten, or fifteen percent more than I feel female. I feel I'm in drag every day of my life. Tim Dahl can attest to this. He's <laughs> yeah, he's no, met you, some of my male characters. You have oh, yes. a lot of really definite I hate to say male energy. well honey if you could see how wide my legs were spread right now because my balls are so fucking big you wouldn't have to say another word <laughs> you definitely have cojones you know <laughs> you know the thing is being speedy right the British yep. <laughs> I got to learn to be an advocate for myself I mean first was being an advocate for my son you fucked with my son you know that yes but being an advocate and setting limits, it was really funny how people assumed that Speedy was Laura. Like I've had, I've had this battle with people where people who had hung out with Speedy and <laughs> then as JT said, well, I know you. It's like, no, you've actually never met me. I think I, we had that conversation because you met Speedy, <laughs> but Speedy was different. Well, Speedy needed to be a cunt. She could be a cunt. Well, face it, Big Lou is always a dick, and not that many people <laughs> want to meet him. As Weasel Walter once said, Big Lou walks into the room, everybody jumps out the window committing suicide before he murders them. I'm just <laughs> saying. <laughs> and there's that laugh again, which I love. Yeah. You know, you know, you, Laura, I, want, I wanted to get this in. Um, you know, even if there wasn't this whole controversy, if you're Laura Albert the whole time and I still don't think you would you could meet all the expectations these fans try to superimpose on you. I mean, their disappointment is something beyond anything that you that you do. It's it's them. It's not well, you. The I disappointment mean, was a construction. I mean, again, it was. I'd rather time. focus on how many people that that didn't care about that and that you yeah, didn't a lot touch. Of people that, yeah. and then, I mean. I, I could spend so much my days writing back to the letters as I get around the world. I mean, and that's what counts. Yeah. You know, I mean, the New York times felt punked and they probably in my lifetime will never forgive me because I, punked wah, 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 <laughs> wah. you know, they've written about me a lot. I haven't really seen it improve anything about my so-called career whatsoever. So they can suck big loose dick as far as I'm concerned <laughs> and face it. It would take more than one mouth to get down there. Not to mention the cojones. <laughs> 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 uh, Laura, I'm just so glad that you Am can... I going to be charged on my credit card for this? Like oh, this? Honey, that'll be the, call, the follow-up call The first one's always free Then I start charging You know how it goes <laughs> I'm just so glad that you're laughing That your son is wonderful is. And that none of this bullshit Actually, it forced you to be stronger And to come out And to be fully who you are. Look, all of it was who you, it was a part of who you are. Yeah. And now somehow, I mean, other people would have crumpled. They could have committed. So, and were you ever well, suicidal well, was, from it this? Was. I, I did. I didn't have some pretty, look, I went through a federal trial where this motherfucker brought an inch thick book trying to put me in jail. He tried to convince the judge that I should be in jail. I mean, it's like, what did it cost him? Chris Hanley actually made a movie where this guy, Jeff Levy Hint, he didn't even, he didn't, he didn't lose shit. He just wanted to make, they wanted to make Sarah Plus, which was, they had the rights to Sarah and they wanted to include my life. And they assumed most people, when you go and say, I want to make you a star, yeah. they throw up in their legs. And I didn't, I refused. I said, and it wasn't about money. It was, if I can't articulate what it was, because to me, it really was a mystery. I, I was creating this because it was how I always survived, right? And there wasn't a part of me that was there saying, oh, this is this dastardly great plot. <laughs> it was like both being inside insanity and out. I knew it, he wasn't real and he was real, you know? And we love Chris Hanley because he's such a weird genius and his cool during the whole catastrophe of the filming of that movie was something to be commended. Uh, and just his bravery in making the films that he, that he makes. We have had him on the and podcast. He, he definitely stuck by me through all oh, of he gets Oh, he gets it. You know, he gets yeah, it. No, he just thought the whole thing was like very... It, it, 
it was wonderful, you know, I mean, and that's the thing. And, you know, there, if you bought a book, you bought a book. I don't owe you anything more at the end of the day. You know, I brought, I brought Harry Potter to life <laughs> by a Taylor Swift record, which God bless Taylor Swift. You know, I really, I am not a Taylor Swift hater, but I'm just saying you don't get Taylor <laughs> Swift, right? <laughs> So she's pretty, her, her, the character of Taylor Swift is pretty snarky, which I have to say, yeah, yeah. that's, you know, that's yeah, a pretty good out. angle. Yeah, no, she, yeah. So, but she ain't but, up my alley, but whatever, but still. The, the thing is, if you had a relationship with him, I, that was a conversation between me and you. And the thing is, I've, I'm, like, for instance, one of the people, Patty Sullivan, who had been hired by Gus Van Zandt to write the Sarah script, right? Because he was going to make We Did Elephant instead. But she had a really close relationship with Jeremy. And now we are really close. And he, she's close with my son, Trev. And, but that relationship is so different than Jeremy's. Like, it, I can feel it. It's like a separate compartment. It's really, at first when we were reconnecting, like getting to know, she would call me, like she called him stink pot and she would call that to me and that didn't feel, it didn't fit. And it took a while to adjust, you know? So I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you're, you're more yourself and more comfortable in your existence and can speak about the things you speak about that need to be detailed. And really that's what's important is that you found a creative method and wrote incredible books, which are in the lexicon of great American fiction. And nobody can take that away from you. And it's not over yet. And that's why we're talking to Laura Albert on the Lydian Spin. Thank you so much, Laura. Well, it, it's an honor because you're an absolute legend. And, I, and so, are, so are you. Aren't you precious? La Loop says, after I carefully cut the burnt black gristle off the half of chicken fried steak I'm splitting with poo. I want to tell them about Dove's Diner and Bali and the big French white puffy chef's hat he earned. I want to take out my bone, dangle it before their eyes, and tell them I'm going to earn the grandest one ever. But I say nothing. La Loop tosses boiled peanuts into the air, and I swear I can see his tongue unfurl like an iguana's and pluck them out of midair. Want some West Virginia spring water? Pooh starts to pour me some of the clear liquid out of a jam jelly glass. Don't you get her on that rut gut. La Loop swipes at her hand. Sorry. Pooh takes a big swig and coughs. So as I was saying, his hand strokes my hair, and I can't help but lean into his touch. If you come work for me, his finger grazes the tip of my ear, raising the hairs on the back of my neck. You'll have a million Barbie dolls. You like Barbie? How many Barbies have I got you, Pooh? A lot, Pooh says and spits after making sure La Loop isn't looking at her. I'd get you all the outfits. Just got Pooh the loveliest fur coat made just for Barbie. Pooh pushes her eyes farther back into her head. I nod. You'll want for nothing ever. His fingers wiggle under my chin tickling me, so I involuntarily jerk my chin to my chest, catching his hand there. He leaves it, then slides it inside my blouse and over my heart. I'm the best daddy you'll ever have, he says in a low voice that's half whisper, half growl. I look down to watch his hand rising and falling with my breath. 
I close my eyes. The warmth of his hand penetrates me. Laloop lets out a laugh and presses harder on my heart. I snap my eyes open to see his face breaking into an immense smile, this time with teeth. Box cutter teeth with gold trim impressed with Norse warrior designs. Welcome aboard, he laughs. We pile into Laloop's purple transam. Pooh climbs over me to sit next to Laloop. We speed through winding back roads that make the tires screech and produce thick billows of red dust. I take little sips of the clear liquid in Pooh's jam jelly jar, and it burns my throat like a thousand fire ant bites. My eyes get too heavy to keep open as the orange reflector lights and the yellow eyes of deer and mountain cougar blaze by us. I start to lean on Pooh, my head falling on her shoulder. With a firm shove, she pushes me, redirecting me to sleep against the door. It's gonna rain down hard, Pooh says. I slowly let my eyes focus on the substantial stone masonry of the Vatican. You best get up, cause the loop just laid a black snake belly up on the freeway divider. Pope John Paul II's face is in the middle of the Vatican, set agreeably upon a bed of curlicue fuchsia hearts. Sky sure looks bluer than end of the month balls though, Pooh says. When I rock my head back and forth, Pope John Paul II winks at me and seems to pucker out little kisses. A black snake belly up is sure to make it wet as a lizard's pawing after payday, Pooh says. I try respectfully to blow a kiss back to Pope John Paul II, but my mouth only flaps. You can't hold your liquor, Pooh's face appears over me, blocking out Pope John Paul II and the Vatican. I try to look past her. You heaved up pretty good, Pooh smiles, then suddenly barks a loud laugh, showing a mouthful of fuzzy gray teeth. Her bruised face appears to liquefy and undulate like goulash. How you managed to splatter all over a car interior and not catch a speck on your own self must be an act of the Lord. She barks again. Not a speck, 